Here to tell us more about it, please give a very warm welcome to Mr. Patrick J. Kennedy. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Victor. And uh, thank you, Mitch, for uh, giving us this great venue. What a great bookstore you guys have down here, huh? Uh, this is, uh, you know, bookstores and libraries. I, first of all, I appreciate libraries more than I ever did before uh, because now I take uh, my three children to Storybook Hour. And uh, we have the best librarian right down the street from us. And the kids just, it's like you ever worry about what you're going to do all day. You've got all these kids. It's like the library is a great place, I tell you. <laughs> uh, <coughs> special and profound appreciation for, and, and this feels so, so much like a great community center. So uh, what a great commons this is. Um, I, uh, I also want to thank... Uh, Sally, and I uh, want to thank uh, Judge Leifman, too, for their being here. Uh, both of them, if, if you don't know uh, your county commissioner and your, and your judge, uh, you don't know uh, some of the leading figures in innovation in mental health policy in this country are right here in the Miami-Dade area. So uh, I hope after, give them a round of applause. Hope after the, um, uh, or rather when we have a, a, some question and answers, you can uh, uh, get a chance to meet them and find out what they're doing. Um, I'll, I'll jump ahead real quickly and say what they're doing is they're changing everything by changing the way the money flows. And if you really want to know beyond all the great policy and thoughtful ideas and how are we going to redo everything and restructure, just follow the money. You know, you want to change everything, change funding streams. And uh, Miami-Dade is doing that. It's, it's getting people out of jail and prison who shouldn't be there because of an untreated mental illness. It's getting them the uh, community-based supports that they need to stay independent and uh, certainly to stay out of jail and from high recidivism rates, which has been something that's plagued a lot of people with uh, severe mental illness and uh, with addiction. Uh, so, uh, and I want to say uh, I have a special privilege. I haven't had a chance to say, see Deanna yet, but uh, Deanna... Kurtman was um, my first legislative director when I was elected to the Congress. Um, and a little bit more about that to come. But just suffice to say, I was elected uh, first to the State House uh, in Rhode Island at the age of 21, and then uh, as the youngest member of the State House. Then I went on and was elected to the United States Congress at the age of 27 as the youngest member of the House of Representatives. And then uh, at age 31, I was elected by my Democratic colleagues to be in leadership of the National Democratic Party. And I just want to make it very clear to all of you that none of it had to do with my last name being Kennedy whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> it was all my good looks and personality. That got me. <laughs> so... Um, Oh, that doesn't seem to be working for uh, Jeb Bush right now, I guess. <laughs> uh, anyway, such is life, you know. Um, I could have never imagined growing up, and, you know, my dad was my hero, and, you know, it's bigger than life in general, and, of course, he had to be, happened to be my dad as well, which, of course, for fathers and sons is, you know, your father's always a big figure. So uh, yeah, I grew up kind of following him at his knee and holding his uh, coat tails and uh, literally and figuratively all the way through. And, and then to have the chance to actually serve with him as his colleague for uh, 15 years, which is just beyond belief. Uh, I tell 
many stories about that relationship because it was pretty pivotal uh, to my whole narrative about where mental health is and how it's accepted and rejected in society. Um, of course, my dad represents the older generation that has a tougher time coming to grips with these things being um, chemistry issues, not character issues. Uh, his generation had trouble understanding these things as medical issues, uh, not moral issues. And so, for me, uh, I also had that world view because, of course, we all adopt our parents' world view. That's how we learn to think as we adopt the thinking of our parents. And so, um, but somewhere along the line, obviously, I think I benefited from having a lot of folks help me start to change my thinking. And I guess I had been less entrenched in the old thinking and it allowed me to confront some of the old thinking that was represented in my, uh, by my dad's generation. So, um, but I, um, I guess I, there's a million way, ways I could go with this, but I guess I would say that, um, you know, my dad's attitude towards my struggles um, and my struggles began at a really early age. I uh, was drinking and smoking marijuana as a teenager. You know, halfway through my teens, I was um, using cocaine, um, still drinking a lot. I was in my first rehab uh, at 17. <clears throat> so uh, things uh, moved pretty quickly for me. And in spite of being in my first rehab at 17, um, my last rehab was at 43. You know, so basically, even though I had gotten all those words of wisdom that you get when you go to treatment, I had to get them over and over and over. Uh, by the way, in you know, 30-day wonder inpatient treatment places, and I, I talk a lot about how our system of care is broken because it's, it's predicated on the notion that these are a series of episodic, you know, incidents as opposed to chronic illnesses. And so we reimburse for them as if you go into crisis, you need treatment, you get treatment, then you're all better, you're all set, you're no problem, no more problems, you know. I mean, and then you think you're fine, and then swear it's not going to happen to you again, and then boom, you're back in, you're wondering to yourself, how in the world did I let this happen? I swore to myself it wouldn't happen again. So uh, it is pretty remarkable that's still the paradigm of treatment in this country. And going back to what I said at the beginning with the judge and, and your commissioner, it's all the money. The money pays for this as, a, uh, as sick care, acute care, as opposed to chronic care. If, if the insurance companies wanted to reduce their spend, they ought to just treat this like they do diabetes and asthma, and every other chronic illness. And you'd have a lot less disability and death. I mean, like, dramatically less. So all of you know that every physical indice of health in this country, you know, in terms of cancer and HIV AIDS and car accidents, all these, all these causes of death, just all, you know, going down. Which are the ones that are going up? Suicide, dramatically, and overdoses, dramatically. And, you know, it's shocking, you know, if you think about suicide's the ultimate failure because 90% of people who, who take their life um, are suffering from a diagnosable mental illness. And what's the final, you know, crisis is that they uh, successfully complete suicide. Many more uh, attempt suicide. It's shocking that we throw up our hands and think there's nothing we can do. 
if we just treated depression like the chronic illness is, it is, what a world of difference we do in reducing overall suicide rates. I mean, we're like, we're all like standing here. I can't, first of all, I can't believe that um, I'm telling you this like it's any news. Like it's, oh boy, isn't Patrick smart? You know, it's like, <laughs> I, I, you're giving me like a, 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 a life because I get to talk about what I want to talk about. But it, the fact that like anybody is paying attention to me, this should be old hat. This should be so blasé, so like, of course we knew that. And of course we're going to pay for it differently. And of course it should, you know, you know, what are you talking about? Everybody knows that, Patrick. If everybody knew that, you wouldn't all be sitting here. And I wouldn't be getting on all these national shows. And people wouldn't be scratching their head saying, isn't that great what Patrick's saying? Um, let me put that in. Thank you. Thank you oh, you bet. Um, so I often say to folks, they... You know, I was the author of the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. And, uh, you know, that's the bill that said that the brain's part of our body. <laughs> yes. yeah. But there was a lot of debate on that, you know. <laughs> you know how Congress is a gridlock, but, I mean, there was some real heavy debates as to whether we should cover the brain like every other organ of the body. And uh, a lot of back and forth as to whether we ought to say whether you're inpatient, in network, or outpatient, in network, inpatient, out of network, outpatient, out of network, or needing emergency room benefits or pharmacy benefits, that if you receive diabetes care, cardiovascular disease care, cancer care at any one of those six boxes at the either the primary care, secondary, or tertiary levels of care. Hard to imagine where, the, where you wouldn't treat cancer at every one of those six boxes at both primary, secondary, and tertiary levels of care if you needed it. Kind of hard to believe if you, with heart disease, you wouldn't treat everything from covering the Lipitor to covering the resuscitation after a heart attack and the rehab to follow. Kind of hard to believe you wouldn't pay for all that. And if you pay for it for every other physical illness, then under this law that we had, you need to pay for it for any brain-related illness. Pretty shocking concept that, you know, it should treat this organ of the body like every other. So that was the bill. And um, I have to say, it sounds like it should be a really popular bill. Like, I mean, all Americans should care, you know, that their brains are covered by their insurance companies. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I would think they'd say that's pretty important to them. How they think about the world, how they perceive everything. Would think people would say, oh, that's important to me. You know, could... Take a lot of way, things away from me, but if you take away my perception of reality and my enjoyment of this life and my ability to enjoy the friends and relationships of my loved ones and my family, I mean, that's pretty central to everything, in case you haven't checked. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty, you can pretty much survive a lot of other physical illnesses, but if your mind isn't right, all bets are off. And you know what's so shocking? We as Americans, we want to look prettier, you know, be smarter, be richer, everything. We just want to have better relationships. We want to, I mean, it's just the, the how-to in these bookstores are just huge, you know. And yet, the one organ that can help all of those things is the one that we dismiss the most in every aspect of our lives. We dismiss it in our education system. I mean, it's like we're trying to, we're like smart bombs, you know, coming in Iraq. We have to hit the target. But, we, you know, we think that we can target kids learning while ignoring the fact they come to school traumatized because of where they grow up. 
or because one parent beats up the other, or that mom or dad has an untreated uh, mental illness or addiction. It's, you can't make this up. And it's not even in our education pedagogy to think about social emotional learning. Sure, the think tanks say social emotional learning is important. They talk about the amygdala, you know, screwing up the way prefrontal cortex works. I mean, these are common terms that neuroscience use as to, to indicate whether your brain can absorb information or not. But we can sign whole generations. In fact, in my district, you know, 40% dropout in every one of my inner cities. And we just, we're like, oh, you know, it's just the status quo. About 40% 40, 40 of the kids aren't going to. Hello, did anyone check, you know, early on? when they were about to start school or as they were going through school, what was going on at home, how, what was going on with them. I mean, it should, we should have to wait till graduation day to be scratching our heads wondering why there was a 40% dropout rate. And yet we do every day in America. It's shocking that we don't have, you know, we check kids when they start school, you know, their eyesight, you know, their hearing, you know, because those are important if they're going to learn. They've got to be able to see and they've got to be able to hear. And they also have to be able to, able to pay attention and absorb information. Other key neurological components to learning. And we don't check it. We check for scoliosis. We make sure you got your inoculations. But nothing on what your ACE score is, your adverse childhood experience score. Find out how high risk you are uh, for trauma. And then, God forbid, we ever ask for a family history of mental illness and addiction. Ooh, that's top secret. Can't ask about that. Too personal. Wait a second. We're talking about everything today. You know, they're advertising erectile dysfunction. They got... You know, they're not thinking anything about, you know, new forms of colonoscopies. And, you know, it's like, you know, where are we? And what the whole taboo that we have about brain illnesses leads us to think that we dare not ask, you know, whether you have a history so that we know, just like you have a family history of cancer or any other disease, we better get in there early. They look at my Irish face and they say, you know what, you might be high risk for cancer. So that's skin cancer. That face of yours looks like it could get really sunburned. I bet you've had a bunch of ex overexposure. You better get in here and get your skin checked by a good dermatologist. They do that because they see my smiling Irish face, but they don't do that for what they ought to also do and see my smiling, you know, genetic profile and say, Kennedy, you probably need to get in there and get screened. We're going to just go ahead and, you know, take some of your hair, because we'll send that off to the lab, find out if you've used marijuana in the last two months, six months, we could tell. You know, well, you know maybe we'll have you do your, your urine screen. It's a matter of, you know, protocol. This is what we do for all patients. But... You know, the notion that that's now like, we don't do that. We ought to be doing it. I'm telling you, I'm going to do it to my kids, whether they like it or not, up until the legal age. They are, I'm going to be in there in the middle of the night when they're sound asleep, <laughs> you know, take, cutting little locks off the top of their head to test whether they've been lying to me or not about using, you know, drugs. And we laugh about it, but I mean, this is it, my friends. Our... Looking the other way is costing lives, and we wake, wake, oh my God, you know, little Susie has a problem, or my cousin has a problem. My brother says, you know, when did you think of asking? We all knew it. None of us bothered to ask. None of us bothered to talk about it because it was too shameful. Or we could say those are personal issues. Better not bring those up because it's there. They'll solve it. Really? Like, well, they'll solve their own cancer, too. They'll just, you know, we won't bother taking them to the doctor and getting some medication. You know, they'll solve their own diabetes, too. We won't bother with any, you know, treatment or family plan. 
I mean, that's literally how we treat these illnesses, as we just dismiss them as, as personal failings. So, uh, so as I said, I got the honor to sponsor this bill. And usually, if there's a really important piece of legislation, you know, you have to be around a long time in Congress before you get to put your name first. You know, my dad, uh, my late father, sponsored a lot of really important pieces of legislation, but he was also uh, the chairman of the most important committee on domestic legislation in the Senate, and he was also in the Senate for nearly 50 years. So if he wanted to put his name first, you know, he had that prerogative over and over because he was the top of the heap, you know, most senior dog. So you can imagine my surprise. I'm like the youngest member of Congress. I'm the, from the smallest state in the country, little Rhode Island. And in the minority party when I first get there. And I go around, I think, you know, you know, the, it's going to be really important for me to get it, my co-sponsorship in the top 200 signatures. Because, you know, there's 435 members of Congress. But I'm betting I can make it in the top 200. You know, because in Rhode Island, we had a signature table like this. If you have a bill and you want to get co-sponsors, you leave it at the clerk's desk. And if a member wants to sign on, they come and they sign on. So you can imagine my surprise when the clerk said to me, Congressman Kennedy, if you want to be the sponsor of the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, the thing that covers the brain, and every single family in America is improved if this happens, it should be the most popular bill that ever came before this Congress. If you want to be the sponsor, it's all yours. And I'm like, well, surely you've made a mistake here. This is some typo because, I don't know, you must got to, go check with someone else. But I guess no other member of Congress wanted the words mental health and addiction next to their name. They didn't want to be known as the sponsor because then they'd have to answer the next question. And either way they answered would be problematic. If they said yes, there'd be 20 more questions. Well, tell us about, you know, your family's problems or your problems. And, by the way, what medication are you on? <laughs> or they could say no, in which they would have confirmed the post-Watergate adage that all politicians are liars and they won't tell the truth. So it's like, you know, take your pick. You know, it's not a very good uh, choice. So um, I had the honor of, of sponsoring it, and my good friend Jim Ramstead was uh, the Republican co-sponsor just in case none of you thought that these are both uh, just affect the Democratic Party, you know, these issues. <laughs> <So. clears throat> um, although I will say it was the Democrats that gave this bill the real push. But then, of course, we were very fortunate. Uh, Republican President George W. Bush was the one that signed it, which is very good for us because it means that we can really rest on the fact that this was a bipartisan bill, which really matters today. Why? Because the next big work for all of us is that we need to implement this law. And you might think, well, it was passed in 2008. Of course it's implemented. Well, no, it hasn't been. And uh, I'm sure all of you who've had family members try to get treatment and get that treatment paid for know better than I, uh, how insurance companies still routinely deny care. So how can they do that? They can do that because they consider it proprietary how they make these medical utilization review decisions. In other words, how they apply medical necessity determination on your family member or your loved one's mental illness. And the fact of the matter is, um, that shouldn't be a secret process. You know, it's our lives that they're deciding about. And we ought to make sure that there is a process by which we determine if there's any higher burden of illness applied to medical utilization review decisions for the mental health patient as compared to the medical or surgical patient. So that's what the law says needs to happen. We need to make sure if they treat cancer, with those limitations, fine, we'll live by it. Sure, we want it differently, but at the very least, we'll take what cancer gets, you know. 
but we can't even be sure we're being treated the same as cancer. And the reason why is because the insurance industry is not disclosing this. But guess what? President of the United States and Secretary of HHS uh, Sylvia Burwell have within their authority now, thanks to the Affordable Care Act, the authority to demand insurance companies disclose how they make medical utilization review decisions. So why aren't they asking and, and getting these insurance companies to disclose? Because, a little secret to how the ACA was passed, it was passed because insurance companies helped it pass. So, you know that phrase, you know, don't, you know, step on the toes of the ones that brought you? You know, that's kind of where we are now, because the administration's loath to go after the very insurers that were helpful to them in getting this thing called Obamacare passed. So, um, so what does that come down to? That comes down to political power. And I'm here to tell you, you know, next to the burden of illness that these illnesses um, create for our country, and it is shocking how little political clout we have in uh, ensuring that our voices are heard. Because frankly, no one wants to put their hand up and say they're a voice or a face or voice of recovery or they're a family member. Um, there's fantastic organizations. Uh, NAMI is represented here. NAMI Miami. Thank you, NAMI, for all your great advocacy. And you've got the key clubhouse here. Thank you for those recovery. But, you know, next to where we need to be, we're still in the woods. Um, so, you know, that's our big challenge. So, if I were to say to you to anything, the message as to why I wrote the book is I, I wanted to get these policy issues out there, but I knew people would like wouldn't even make it to page three. They'd be so bored with this policy stuff. Uh, so I thought I'd add a little sex appeal. <laughs> I thought I'd uh, throw a little scintillating sensationalism in there. Talk a little, talk a little gossip. Uh, really bring them in, bring them in. And once I got this thing on the bestseller list, then maybe a few people might read into it and understand a little bit more about the history of the mental health movement, um, where we are today, and why it is that even today we have record number of people homeless, record number of people in our jails and prison, and record number of people taking their life every year, and record number of people dying of overdose and wondering why in the world in the seven years President Obama's been in office, he did his first event on the opiate crisis last week. Took him seven years. I mean, I love the president. I support her of his. All. But the fact that no one in his administration said, you know, Mr. President, this is a big pressing issue. You have an opportunity every year to issue a report. He's never done it. And, and I wish I could say uh, my Republican friends had, you know, had one up on us on this. Um, but unfortunately, as you've heard from comments on the right, and especially some of these um, press conferences and debates, uh, it, I mean, the disparaging, stigmatizing rhetoric of those on the right and the left. I mean, it's just abysmal in this day and age that our public officials are so mum on this because you know it feeds the public perception that why talk about this because you can't do anything about it. And I'll conclude with this. We can do something about this. If you intervene first incidents of psychosis, you intervene first into all this has been demonstrated. Tom Insel did the studies at National Institutes of Mental Health. You permanently change the trajectory of someone's uh, disability. Permanently change it. And guess what? That's the same of all physical illnesses. You intervene at stage one cancer, guess what? You got a good chance of beating it. You wait till it's stage four, chances aren't so good. 
So what do we do in this country? You have this big story in the Miami paper today. You all saw the front page about the horrendous situation in your state mental health, forensic hospitals, and so forth. You know, we don't have to wait for people to get that sick before we put a place where they get taken care of. At that stage, they're already falling off the cliff. Why don't we stop and keep them from falling off the cliff as a matter of public policy? For their sake and everyone's sake, their family's sake. And we know what to do. If you intervene, you know, first instance, you break the cycle of the pathology of the illness in the brain, you interrupt it. Interrupt means it doesn't get worse. And with much smaller amounts of medication, people can live very um, fulfilled lives. And with the fraction of the amount of medication that many of them have to come to depend upon, because by the time they end up getting put on medication, they're already stage four. And then we blame them for going off their medication because the side effects are so bad. So, and this can be true not only with severe and persistent mental illness, it can be true of addictions, you name it. All illnesses have that spectrum of severity. And if caught early, as opposed to us waiting till there's a crisis before we respond, we can permanently change the trajectory of all mental illnesses. That's the good news. So I hope that um, you'll read all about these, uh, these stories that you'll also find in the Kennedy book section of the store. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I have to go into them too much, but uh, suffice it to say, I'm the only one who thought they were a secret. I'm the only one who kept keeping the secret to my own peril. Stuffing, stuffing, stuffing. Thinking that no one else knew and they weren't going to know if I had anything to say about it because I was going to be damned if I let any of those people, you know, criticize my family. And I was buying into the, the storyline that these were things that were to be ashamed of. Like that my mom like willingly got up every day in the mid-afternoon and would shuffle to the kitchen in front of a full house of senior advisors to our, and our nation's top policymakers. And none of them looked up. None of them even bothered to look up. It was, we all knew what was going on. No one dared to breathe a word because we couldn't wait for her to go back to her room and shut the door. That was how. And you know what? I can't tell you how many other families have come up to me since this book came out and told me, you know what, they, they grew up in that same elephant in the room. It was everywhere in their house, and none of them could say a word about it. And they didn't have the big specter I had that, you know, someone was going to print, uh, you know, 35,000 copies of their family secrets and put it all over the place. I mean, they, they, they're they just trying to keep it in their neighborhood, you know, to keep it to a minimum. But, I mean, it's just shocking to these, you know, this day and age that we still think that people voluntarily get up every day and think of how much they can alienate their friends and their family members and their neighbors. Like, let me see today... I am going to make my brother really hate me. My mom's going to want to kick me out of the house. My friends are going to say, oh, there he goes again. What an idiot. Like, do we really get up every day and think, because we're like, if you read David Brooks' Social Animals, so, I mean, we're, we're programmed to want to be loved, embraced, respected, admired. I mean, we, that's just a, our human nature. So what is it about us? you know, who just can't seem to get it together, that we want to go around and make everybody hate us and isolate us and marginalize us. These are not things that anybody willingly does in their lives. But um, we have a lot to do to change those, uh, that mindset because we still haven't understood the, uh, the connection between uh, brain illness and, and, and behavior. We, we still haven't understood that, 
that important um, understanding that these are symptoms. Um, so we, we prefer to just say they're a loser and they ought to get it together and so forth. So um, all I could say to you is I hope uh, you support uh, your local officials who are doing a lot. You support your federal officials who are doing a lot. And if they're not doing what you think they ought to be doing, that you make your voices heard. Uh, because the only way we're going to change this for the next generation, if that's for your grandchildren, for some of you, or my uh, case, my kids, I don't want them to live in the same, you know, old thinking that, uh, that I grew up in. I, I want them to f be free. And, and I want a checkup from the neck up to be as ordinary part of a physical exam with any part of the <laughs> doctor's visit. And I hope that we have the collaborative care models that everyone shows huge results in the reduction of all disability in this country if insurance companies paid for this. And guess what? They save money too because you reduce all these other you know, overutilization of the hospitals and overutilization of this and not compliant with that, all these other costs embedded in the system, all because of uh, uh, not treating underlying mental illnesses and addiction. So uh, I hope that uh, you'll help me in changing all that. In the, in the meantime, you know, I hope you'll, you'll get involved with your local NAMI and you'll understand that this key clubhouse is a great vehicle for people uh, living in, in your community to have a, a place to, where they are loved and accepted and embraced as opposed to being left you know, on the side of the street or left in jail where no one at all uh, loves or cares about them. At least there are places like this that really do have a heart for the, for the population amongst us that we are all least sympathetic with. So I, I really want to salute all of you who spend your lives caring for people with mental illness and with addiction. It's, it, the, you know, it's not an easy thing what you do, and you certainly don't get paid for it, that's for sure. Uh, but I hope all that will change in the years ahead. I hope they won't be looked uh, down upon. I hope you won't be looked down upon for caring for them, and I hope we'll have a much more enlightened society um, in the intervening years. So. With that, Victor, you tell me what you want to do. We have plenty of time for questions from the audience, so that's what we could do now. This first one, we have a good friend of the store right there. <laughs> So I know what the symptoms are, and I have a behavior. And now I have a friend from my temple who I'm pretty sure is also bipolar and didn't realize it, because when she first joined the temple, she was over the top and involved in everything and really being And now, for the past few months, she's been depressed. Yeah. So, and she looked like she was really in bad shape. So I called her up one day. Well, you did the most courageous thing. I mean, everything I've just talked about, you, you have uh, defied what society has told you. you sh you've done the right thing. So I would, I would uh, first take you know, some solace in the fact that you've already done what you're supposed to do. Um, and then uh, I'd say, you know, you've got to, you know, where it's possible for you to encourage it without being too overbearing on it. But, you know, we also can't fix other people either. And I can't tell you how many people come to my book signings who, you know, tell me these heart-rendering stories about their loved one who's just, you know, in crisis or this and that. And they said, what can I do? What can I do? And I said, you can get some help too. Because 
you're never going to help any one of those folks that you want to help unless you're, you know, got your head screwed on tight too. Like I know, like the the plane said, put your mask on first, then you help others. So, yeah, yes. Uh, first, I want to thank you so much. This is so so necessary and so long overdue. You're so courageous. I want to tell you. I have the same sponsor as your mother in AA, <laughs> only I went a different route. Yeah. But I had to leave my situation. I, I, I left the marriage of 47 years because I couldn't, I couldn't handle the, my picture of an alcoholic was not a nice Jewish girl who only drank fine wine and champagne. Right. And um, I've had seven hospitalizations. And two of the hospitalizations, I had ECT, yeah. you know, electrophoresis yes. therapy. And um, I take one medication for the first time in my life, because I'm not a medication person. And uh, I take lithium, which I swear by. But the doctors do not tell you. The doctor, after I had my ECT and left the hospital, not one phone call from the doctor to see how I was doing. They don't tell you anything to do. I myself know what to do and have taken care of myself, and that's why I'm here today to be able to talk to you. But they don't know. Yeah. They don't know about good nutrition. They don't know about exercise. They don't tell you. They don't tell you about meditation. They don't tell you about all of the things that really are healing for us. That's right. It's, it's, you, you just cannot make it up. You know, the whole thing that the president did with this opiate thing was that he said doctors should be trained on addiction. We're going to try to expand the number of doctors. Like, this ought to be core curricula for every physician. The notion that it's like some little extracurricular, you could choose it or not, that's the way it is in most med schools. And mental illness, too. It's like, you know, it's on the margins of what is considered essential to being a physician. So, yeah, our whole medical establishment, and by the way, does the AMA or any of the professional organizations really move on this? No, they don't. I mean, it's really unbelievable. Um, you mentioned depression. depression. You're leaving out anxiety. No, yeah. And one time I took a whole bottle of Ativan because I wanted to kill the anxiety. No, I'm with you. I didn't want to kill myself. I wanted to kill the. Uh, I wanted to kill that anxiety. I couldn't move two feet to go into the bathroom. Yeah, no, I'm. I'm with you. I woke up three days later in the hospital. Well, I'm glad to see you here, and I hope you are able to buy one of my books. That's what the. I mean, I, I mean, I'm glad you made it out of the hospital because I'm counting on you to buy. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks. So. Uh, as a follow-up to your presentation in Charleston with the judge, there's two federal, and I'm speaking to everybody, there's two federal bills that actually have our language in it. One is to keep these people insured on Medicaid, and the other one is to give them uh, treatment for mental health, mental illness, and addiction while they're in the criminal justice system. So I'm making a commercial plug because he's already committed to campaigning for it. It's H.R. 953, if anyone has a pen, and H.R. 1854. These bills in the House need co-sponsors. Steve and I have been up in Washington, and you've got a lot of friends still there. Um, this awesome. is our language that's in it to get the money. So uh, hopefully you all will reach out. We vote. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. I just started reading it a few days ago and I found out today in the paper that you're going to be here. I come from a long family of alcoholics and schizophrenics. And uh, it was very difficult to watch them all pass away from, different, from, all, from the alcoholism and the schizophrenia. Uh, two brothers, my father, lots of aunts and uncles. Uh, cousin in Portugal just died this month of alcoholism, she was 71. And I just wanted to say that I came in in 86, 
treatment center at South Miami Hospital, and I've been sober 29 years. I love that because it, it really, when they say it runs in your family, it sounds like it gallops in your family. And the reason why you're telling us uh, that you've had 29 years of continuous uninterrupted sobriety is because no one would believe, given the deck being stacked against you, in your genetics and certainly the environment of all the losses that you've suffered, that you would be able to continue to remain in recovery, and frankly, you're amongst the 23 million Americans who have real time, and no one knows about it. And the problem is, is all they hear about are people who aren't successful in recovery. So all their mindset is, is that recovery doesn't work. And so I want you to all get that message from what you just shared, is that recovery uh, can and does work. Um, you've got to work at it. That's a good point. That's in the back of thank the you. Uh, Thank you so much for your inspirational talk. And I hope, I'm assuming most of you, like myself, are either a family member or a consumer with mental health um, uh, issues. And I'm a family member, and I have um, many people in my family affected. I'm also a founding member of the Key Clubhouse of South Florida that thank you for giving us a plug. These are the kind of programs, innovative programs, that help your family members or yourself with schizophrenia, with bipolar disorder, get back into the community, get back to work through transitional employment, supported employment, and independent employment. It does work, and it works here in Miami. But without all of you speaking up and coming with us to Tallahassee and calling your legislators and emailing your legislators and asking for that money to be dispersed differently than it's being dispersed now, it won't make any difference because our little key clubhouse with our couple hundred thousand dollars um, can do more than some of these million dollar programs and without your voice, we won't get a chance to do that. So all I'm, all I'm here to say is thank you um, and thank you all because we need your voice so please, there's advocates in the room, NAMI, Key Clubhouse. Are you running for office? Time. All I want to know is where. I want to know. Everyone wants to know where to send their ballots in for you right now. Yeah, sure. As, a, as a, also a founding board member of the Key Clubhouse, I'm here to tell you that even if you don't catch it at the very beginning, my 40 year old son, that we caught it at perhaps stage four. Yeah. And so we in the Key it's never too late. It, and it can be done. And That's my right. son is a product of it. But we're missing all the pieces of the continuum of care. And I had to take my son to NIH to get what he needed to get started and to get the right medication that he couldn't get down here. So Miami Dade County is in the dark ages compared to other states, I understand. But we know all we need. You referred to 30 days and out. It's three days and out. Yeah, right. Four days no, I know. And, out. and then, like Sandy said, then you, you, you expect to take care of yourself. If you had a heart operation, they don't send you home and never call you again. In a, in a, so that the folks with mental illness, they're held for three or four days and go home, and there's no follow-up care. We're just a small piece of the pie. And yeah. I repeat. What I love it. Said. John. Uh, in response to Find me after me, and I'll give her my card. We'll get a peer to get in touch. And peers are very successful at engaging consumers. They've been there, they've done it, and maybe it will help. So if you can find me after we Awesome. Thanks so much, Sean. And uh, so 
uh, he's uh, thank you so much. You've mentioned NAMI a few times. I need to put in a plug. I'm Robin Cole. I'm the president of your chapter here, Miami Day chapter. NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. We offer support groups for families and for those in recovery. We offer education, 12 week course to understand everything from diagnosis, coping skills, and how to get involved in advocacy. They're all free. You can find information about us online at namiofmiami.org. Find me afterward, I have brochures. We'd love to have you involved. You're hearing about what needs to happen. We have advocacy movements happening. Find us and get, in, get signed up and get involved. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being here. So, so, you know, the reason I, I thought everybody would get my point that we are absolutely ignoring and turning our back on everybody with these illnesses. I think f the greater society only has this put into view from these terrible tragedies of these mass shootings. It's the only way that they understand and come to be familiar with our issues. And it's really a even more of an insult to injury that we do not uh, have another narrative out there about how many people with mental illness are. I've been uh, and seen these jails and you see people with active psychosis uh, getting beaten up. I mean this is a physical illness. These people are being terrorized and beaten up. They're victims of, of all kinds of crime at a far higher percentage than anyone else because we so, you know, have this uh, worldview that they are to be blamed for their illnesses and, 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 and society visits a huge retribution on them for this. Uh, and so that's the only prison that we understand it. I think that's very tragic uh, because that's what continues to perpetuate the stigma against people with these medical illnesses. You're absolutely right. Every single one of these tragedies, you can look back and say, what's the outstanding characteristic of each of these people? Whoever it was, they turned their backs on them. Bless you. And in many instances, it was clear that some of them had an early diagnosis and then fell through the cracks. But all the commentary on them was that all I used to see him every once in a while, I used to wear, you know, army fatigues and stay in his room all day. You know, like, you know, all, uh, you know, he just, you know, you know, he got kicked out of class because he was acting out, he got this. I mean, it's like, you just go down the list and it's like, what's the, the indictment should be on us as a society that we never had it within our own purview to capture someone who, if they were having a heart attack, you would have come in there and you would have had the, you know, uh, defibrillator. defibrillator, thank you, uh, and brought them right back because then we all care about your health if it's a heart problem. But if it's a brain problem and you're acting out and you're talking to yourself, damn it, I hope you can find a nice warm place underneath that dumpster around the corner. So I have to tell you, I am... Uh, I'm not happy with the when the only time they talk about these illnesses is when they talk about them in that category because I don't think any one of these people um, in their right mind goes out and does what these perpetrators have done. Now some of, there may be some evil people out there and I don't uh, think that that's an impossibility. But I think when you look at the histories of most of these folks, as far as I can tell, it was pretty clear that they had an illness and that no one bothered to take, pay any attention to it. And, uh, and that really, um, and my, my heart goes out to those families and they ought to be blaming us as a society as much as they're blaming any one of those people actually had the gun. Because we allowed this to happen <clears throat> by not taking care of those individuals. You hear what I'm saying? Um, and, you know, so the trauma is enormous. And the trauma is on all those family members who have lost a loved one in these tragedies. 
And I can tell you, and I have told you in my book, about the impact that that has on the whole family, that we disregard, we, we put the names and faces of the people who are killed in these awful tragedies up there, and we say to ourselves, you know, you know, oh, they were cut short in the prime of their life and all of these things. And we never think about all of the wives and children and parents and sisters and brothers that are standing right behind these loved ones whose lives now are permanently changed because this tragedy took place. And, and the best thing we can do to have compassion for those family members is to do everything we know how to do to keep those things from happening again. And it's very clear what we need to do. We need to take the Ray's report and take it to scale and cover every single person in this country at first incidence of schizophrenia. We can track whether you've had meningitis or, or the influenza at CDC. Bless you. That was very well timed. I talked about influenza and knowing exactly. <clears throat> you go in to Miami, um, one of Miami hospitals, and if you presented with one of those illnesses, any number of illnesses, boom, you get put right in the computer. It gets beamed automatically to Centers for Disease Control. Why don't we do that for people with uh, these illnesses? Because if we did, we'd say, well, what are you doing, University of Miami? Or do you have the team here? To, to make sure that they have the wrap around? Do you have your NAMI families here to, to wrap around with their family members so they're not alone? Do you, have you figured out how to put the safety net in place? Did you get them on the medications they need so they don't have to be on high levels later on? These are the things we know how to do. And yet, all what we do, we have the merry-go-round. Every one of these tragedies we talk about we, we have Donald Trump, you know, calling them all crazy people. And we've got uh, all my colleagues saying it's all about guns. And Lord knows, guns need to have their place in this debate. But, I mean, can we not get something done to just do the simple things that every one of the experts say, if we do, we'll reduce the number of, number of total tragedies like this going forward. And guarantee, take it to the bank. If you had that kind of promise, would you sit on your hands and continue to let these things happen? Or would you do something about it? The real indictment is on our political system for not doing what we know works and could be presenting these things in the future. Let's take, let's take two more questions. Yes. I'm a psychologist myself, and what I wanted to bring up to this conversation is the fact that we are also dealing with a lot of a culture that over-medicates. That's right. That uh, over-diagnoses. We have children age two, I've seen this, being prescribed medication that only increases the likelihood of their aggression on occasions. So I just wanted to put that out there and present those to you and see uh, uh, so it goes back to the fact that we have no f real medical education for all this physician community. You know, I'd say 80% of the antidepressants, antipsychotropic drugs are written by physicians who've gotten no tr training whatsoever in this space. So the answer is not to put a chilling effect on people taking medications which may well be what saves them, like any other medication would save them from any other illness, but to only prescribe those medications with a clinician that's trained and has it, that knowledge to know when it's appropriate, as, a, as opposed to now, you know, yes, scripts are flying off the shelf, and it's, and, but I don't want anyone to misread what I'm saying. And that is people have a tough time taking meds, to the first, for many people do. And, and they're looking for the quickest excuse to say, oh, that stuff's you know, overdone. And, it's, oh, and they don't take their medications when it, it could mean the difference for them of surviving and not surviving. So 
we have to be very careful how to jump on that let's bash pharma train, let's bash, you know, all these medications. They have their place, but clearly when you don't have the physician community that's writing most of them trained on how they should be properly used, then you have situations that you described, and that needs to be weighed in the bigger perspective. Well, yeah, yeah, so that's a much bigger debate, but it, it is a tragic thing that we have, uh, um, you know, our medications advertised. We also used to have the fairness doctrine, which allowed news organizations to actually present the news as opposed to presenting ideal ideological points of view. But there's lots of things we can't change in the world. And we, we may be able to, but let's pick the ones that we have a better chance of changing now. I think we have one last question back there. The woman with the hat. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Patrick, thanks so much for this presentation and the NAMI folks are very friends of mine. But I wanted to take a little switch um, uh, and, and a question about this because it seems to me mental illness is different from physical illness in some ways. That's right. Or, you know, and I'm, I'm a Unitarian Universalist minister. I teach religion here, and um, and it seems to me that that part of what is needed here is the religious community speaking out about this because I think there's still this sense that you know we need exercise. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and I think until we get this at 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 a, at a theological level and, and more of a philosophical level uh, to break through those. Absolutely. Um, so I'm wondering if you've given any thought to that. Yes. So for most Americans, they go to their pastor, rabbi, priest, you know, imam, to get their, you know, to have their discussion. You know, they really, it's true. For most people, um, that is their point of uh, interface. And, and most of all the ecumenical community, like the physician community, have no idea what the line is between just you know, moral troubles and medical issues. There is a line. We need to do a much better job in the kind of bringing all of the ecumenical community to understand that there are things that, that they can do to be better affiliated with a medical you know, kind of connection. So if some of their parishioners do have issues and they're not equipped to deal with those issues, that they're not dispensing medical advice. So I, I agree with you. Um, and uh, we, we definitely need to address that. And, uh, and I think I'd also say that, you know, for myself, um, living a, a spiritual life, which means that I, I pray every day um, more than once, I, uh, I, I think it's profound when I'm able to enjoy the moments I have with my wife and my kids, that I don't take those things for granted, that I try to be nice and tolerant of people that I don't feel like being nice and tolerant towards, <laughs> that those are all things that help me have a better chance at staying sober and sane today. And so I, I am, I, I've talked all about the medical because I, am, I want us to change our mindset that these are medical brain issues and we can't just fob this all off on really good, you know, this or that. I, these are medical issues, but I, I can attest it's medical because I do take medicine for my illnesses, but I also know that medicine alone wouldn't do it for me. It's medicine and a 12-step meeting with my peers who, by the way, call me throughout the day and send me emails and texts, and it's a supportive family who encourages me, sometimes more than not, depending on how I am <laughs> beginning the end of the day, to get out to that meeting um, and so forth. So, uh, I, and you know, so all of those things are components, and none, none of them alone. Can, can do it. And so for some people, their organized religion can be a big, big source of support, too, for them in their lives. And I think that that's where 
they ought to be. So I'll finish talking about anything more taboo than talking about political positions, talking about you know religious uh, issues. But thank you very much. Yes. You know, we've done, um, we have done a lot of events here at Books and Books, but I can't think of a more important one than the one that we've had this afternoon. So I thank all of you for coming and sharing, and I certainly thank Patrick Kennedy for what he's doing on behalf of all of us. Thank you so very much. By the way, the...